Hello friends and welcome to this third Sunday of Advent. Although we can't be together during this regular time of worship either here in the sanctuary or over in the chapel for the summit services, we have of course followed the guidance from our Episcopal leadership not to have large gatherings and so it is that we have postponed the regular services on Sunday as well as the other events uh, throughout the week. The exception to that would be the AA groups and the related ones uh, associated with it uh, for that support. So the building will still be open for those events and we'll let the AA groups uh, work that for themselves. But I encourage you to continue to be on the lookout for the information that's coming out from uh, the church through our constant contact emails as well as on the website and on the Facebook page as things continue to develop. Church Council will meet tomorrow night by teleconference and the cluster leaders and other church leadership will uh, confer there to decide what further things to do. So be on the lookout through the sources I mentioned for the updates as they come to you. One thing that will continue to be available is pastoral support. Even though we will not be in the office for the present time, the staff will largely be telecommuting but we will be in and out uh, periodically throughout the week uh, to take care of particular business. But should there be an emergency situation where pastoral support is needed, as always, if you call the church number, it will ring through to an option that you can get in touch with a pastor for that type of emergency immediate support. But this morning for the message, we continue on with the lectionary series. This is, this is the same bit of scripture that I would have been preaching normally on Sunday mornings anyway. As you know that 90% of the time or more, the pastors here at Mount Zion preach from the Revised Common Lectionary. And so this morning I'm preaching from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And I invite you to hear as the Apostle writes, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom He has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners... Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The main point or the main theme of this segment of text is one that's really not so easy to pinpoint because Paul is mentioning so many topics in close proximity to one another. He talks about peace with God, about access to God, about hope in the glory of God for salvation. He speaks of joy and suffering and God's love for us. And I believe to understand this better, it helps to keep a, a mind on the two-sided reality of Christian life. On one hand, we are complete in Christ. And on the other hand, we are growing in Christ. And so we acknowledge both the presence of Christ as well as the pressures of this life. We enjoy the peace that comes from being made right with God and in relationship with God, but we still face daily challenges that can help us grow. In the first four chapters of this letter, 
Paul presents the truth of what we refer to as justification by faith. That is being made right with God through faith in Christ. And then here in chapter 5, it's sort of like the turning of a hinge as Paul begins to elaborate on the results of this new status with God given to us in Christ and what follows. And one of those is peace with God. People talk about finding peace in all kinds of ways. They talk about trying to find peace with themselves or maybe they talk about one day being able to rest in peace or, or maybe just finding that, uh, as the song goes, maybe a, just a, a peaceful, easy feeling. But uh, these perspectives to me really seem to convey more of an absence of something. It, for example, the absence of hostility. But Paul is talking about something that is conveyed it, rather than some sort of an absence. It's a general sense of harmonious well-being. It's something that's imparted. It's present. It's active. It's something that's shared. It's the state of harmony with God that believers who have been made right with Him enjoy, which grows by grace as we live more fully into that relationship which we live out day by day as we were led onward and perfected by the Holy Spirit. But I believe we should be careful not to misunderstand the peace that God wants to give us. I say that because true peace we may be tempted to think should mean that, well, now that I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ and I've been made right before God, well, there should be no no more problems or worries that I have to contend with. And some who claim the name Christian argue for this definition of peace with God. And it isn't hard to run across someone teaching that a, a Christian who exhibits real faith would be one who will enjoy material prosperity and physical well-being and, and so forth, which can be very misleading and undercut the real nature and the extent of the peace with God that we are meant to experience. The reality is that in the midst of all things, we don't understand and we can't explain everything that happens except that we understand that we live in a fallen world where There is evil of various sorts that also exists and prowls around pursuing destructive ends, which points to the reality of the gravity that Paul speaks about regarding suffering there in verse 3 and 4, though it may be hard to hear. But the bottom line is that suffering is not to be unexpected, even in the Christian life. Jesus reminds us of that, promised that in this world you will have trouble which Paul affirms by introducing the fact of suffering in verse 3 without any preamble, no kind of explanation or preface. He just goes right to it and states it outright. And so though unwanted, can there be any purpose in this? Well, what Paul says about suffering, we find echoed in James and also 1 Peter. The trials of life can be useful as a means of tempering our faith and giving substance and strength to our Christian commitment. And in that commitment, after we have accepted and professed our faith in Jesus Christ, we step off into a life that is intended to become more like His. We relent to the activity of the Holy Spirit to form us in this way, and the overarching feature in all of this is faithfulness. We see faithfulness required in the life of Christ Jesus to do what He did, to continue to do what He does for us. And so it is for those of us who claim the name of Christ, who are called His disciples, that our life is to reflect this same faithfulness. Beloved, this particular time that we're in, and I don't mean just this time that we're in as a local congregation called Mount Zion United Methodist Church or this local community of East Cobb and even beyond outward into the state of Georgia or this nation, but indeed as the grand community of humanity in this world. It's a time that we are to showcase this faithfulness in Christ. 
the coronavirus outbreak and the, the measures that we are taking to inhibit to its spread present really a unique opportunity to grow in Christ. And that's because to be faithful in our call to Jesus, to serve Him, to serve others, we'll need to be more vigilant in attending the various and typical means of grace that we already understand, such as being in prayer, reading Scripture, serving other people, in our financial stewardship that we are able to take advantage of online through our website, through the United States Postal Service, all of this still functioning as important tools in keeping our ministries fueled locally and around the world in ways that we share with our sister churches. And beloved, all of us are challenged to be more creative in our personal ministries to which we're all called and to which we all share, exploring and becoming more robust in such things as our online presence like we're enjoying today together. We've been talking about this for some time, and so it's a time to get better at it. And even the not-so-technical aspects of the tools we, we employ for ministry, like the good old-fashioned telephone to, to employ for calling people in our care ministries or just simple coordination together about the things that we need to be doing. And so it is, beloved, that I am hopeful that this time will be an enriching time for the very reason that it is difficult. And while I do not believe for one second that God is doling out hardship so that we might get to do good in a time of difficulty, I know that God is able to redeem it, that the Holy Spirit can utilize it to grow us as more effective Christians, and that being individually and that being collectively as well. And ironically, and in a peculiar way that we may see God at work as we are drawn together, though we are now apart. Beloved, this is the hope and the peace in which we rejoice in the midst of all things. Let us pray. Dear great and gracious God of all creation in Jesus Christ, you traveled through towns and villages curing every disease and illness. And at your command, the sick were made well. Come now to our aid in the midst of the global spread of the coronavirus that we may experience your healing love. Heal those who are sick. And may they regain their strength and health through quality medical care. Heal us from our fear, which prevents nations from working together and neighbors from helping one another. Heal us from pride in which we may claim invulnerability to a disease that knows no borders. Lord Jesus, reveal your closeness in this time of uncertainty, of anxiety, and of sorrow. Be with the families of those who are sick or who have died. And as they worry and grieve, defend them from illness and despair. May they know your peace. Be with the doctors the nurses, the technicians, the researchers, and all medical professionals who seek to heal and to help those afflicted and affected and who may put themselves at risk in the process. May they know your protection and peace and be with the leaders of all nations. Give them the foresight to act with charity and true concern for the well-being of the people they are meant to serve and protect. Give them the wisdom and the vision to invest in long-term solutions that will help prepare for or prevent future outbreaks. And may they know your peace as they work together to achieve it on earth. And whether we are at home or abroad, surrounded by many people suffering from this illness or only a few, O oh Lord, stay with us as we endure and mourn and persist and serve. In place of our anxiety, give us peace. Jesus Christ, heal us. In your precious and most beautiful name we pray. Amen. Beloved, praise be to God. And may the peace of God be with you.